And we are live and it is being recorded at this time. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so I will call the meeting to order and ask our um, uh, recording secretary, um, Ms. Cleary, if you could call the roll, please. Councilmember Sawyer? Here. Councilmember Alvarez? Present. Councilmember Fleming? Councilmember Fleming? Here. Oh, thank you. Let the record reflect that all members are present. Excellent, thank you very much. And members of the public may view and listen to the, the meeting as noted on the city's website and as noted on the agenda. Members of the public wishing to speak during item three, public comment, or during the public hearing items will be able to do so by utilizing the raise hand feature, um, uh, their, feature their hand or sorry, typo, or pressing number nine on their note. The wording can be adjusted, but not the content. Um, um, that, was, that was a special message to me. I think we've covered that, that this is all covered under the Brown Act and it does offer an, a, an ability of the public to weigh in on items on our agenda. Um, so, uh, this for clarity, Council Member, uh, Chair uh, Sawyer, it's, uh, if you're joining by phone, it's star nine. Star, uh, star nine, thank you, that's my glasses. Not number nine, star nine. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and we have already taken the roll. Um, public comments, is there anyone who'd like to address the subcommittee on items not on the agenda? There are no hands raised at this time. All right, thank you very much. So then we will move on to uh, onto the agenda um, and with, with new business, 3.1. Um, Ms. De La Rosa, would you like to introduce that item? Yeah, so um, I thought what I'd do since this is our second um, meeting of the Economic Development Subcommittee and we had been meeting for, I think a year uh, with the Economic Recovery Task Force, I thought it would be helpful to go over um, where we were with the task force. Um, so we can talk about um, efforts that we're, we, uh, we've been doing um, and how we used the task force, how we uh, talked about um, uh, next steps or what this count, the council members or the subcommittee rather are interested in, how we accept new items to consider. Um, we had such a great uh, task force. I think we uh, were able to be both responsive to, to the pandemic, but also uh, continue to move forward on uh, other council priorities. So, um, so that's just, I was just gonna go through that and then maybe we could have a discussion about um, what you'd like to see brought forward here, um, how we wanna have these discussions now that we're a Brown Act committee versus a task force. So next slide, please, Eileen. So we had <laughs> um, a very long list of things that we, uh, we put onto our economic recovery task force. Um, we accepted anything, any idea from anywhere um, throughout the entirety of, of what, when we met. Um, by the time um, we ended that, that uh, task force in December, uh, it culled down to um, what you'll see on these next two slides. And we basically had prioritized efforts and parking lot efforts. Um, what we were able to accomplish is pretty much seen on this slide. Um, there are ongoing programs, but I'll go through them. So um, actually council member Alvarez, just before you joined um, the council, uh, uh, gave us um, authorized $2 million for a child care support pilot program. Um, that we've started the first phase of that pilot program, which is a cash infusion just to try to get, uh, to try to retain uh, as many child care businesses as we could to the other side of the pandemic. Um, and then the second phase was to expand capacity and, and, um, and uh, get more facilities uh, uh, built within Santa Rosa. So what happened with this one, if you'll recall, is that we've lost almost 50% of our childcare businesses in Santa Rosa. The majority of, of childcare is done through family uh, home care. Um, whether it's licensed or unlicensed, the registration, uh, the registered uh, child care providers 
mostly in um, Santa Rosa are mostly out of the home and they're where we have the most capacity. And so the, the stabilizing business part of it came from grants that were running through first five, um, as well as uh, we've doubled the number of training uh, slots that four C's provides. Um, and so we just sort of did a pass through of about $600,000 uh, to these two nonprofits to be able to stabilize the businesses. Um, what's coming next, and we've only just started to have this conversation, is what does this next phase look like with the rest of the money, the $1.5 million? Um, and I'd like to keep this task force as the primary task force <laughs> through which we sort of vet these ideas as we develop this program. Um, what we're looking to do is uh, bring in more partners from the outside to leverage the funds. Um, with grants, it's sort of you use it and then that program is done. And we want to see how we can uh, uh, expand the remaining million five that we have in the program uh, so that it sort of uh, regenerates itself or we can eke it out as long as we possibly can. Yeah, um, are there any questions? Sorry, Isa, can yeah. I, I know it's highly unusual for, a, um, for somebody, like for a, um, a panelist to jump in here, but I just want to, can I just add a couple of things? Yeah, actually it would be super helpful if you guys jump in throughout this whole thing. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, Eddie, um, just for your um, edification is like, this is perhaps like the the thing that has happened on council that I'm most proud of that um, I feel like is the biggest win 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 for both business, uh, the business community, families, children. It's an intergenerational like cross sector anti poverty program that helps women and women of color and and um, in particular, and it's just something that I'm really excited about and what I'm my greatest hope is that it doesn't just end up being this one and done type of thing, but that, um, you know, as the pandemic allows and, um, and as, you know, we move out of that, that this is somehow like something that we can expand to become more of a regional effort and something that other jurisdictions partner with us and maybe um, we're able to get more funding from philanthropic organizations. Um, because there is, you know, the Chamber of Commerce has been doing a lot um, on childcare for a long time. And um, I know there's some interest, you know, with Supervisor Hopkins around this stuff. So I'm hopeful that that we can take this on the road, that we can garner more support, and that this is not just the beginning of something in our community, but the beginning of a municipal movement toward, um, because one of the things that's, you know, takes forever is like building housing, and we should do that. You know, repairing roads, we should do that. But the second you know, biggest economic driver um, after housing is childcare and it can largely be mobilized very quickly um, with the right investments. And so um, I, I hope my excitement is not too overwhelming, but I just wanted to put an exclamation point on this one and thank Raisa for her awesome leadership on this and John for sharing my vision. And, um, and I just can't wait to see what happens. And this might be a question for the city attorney, um, not to put um, city attorney Burke on the spot, but um, you know, what we did so well in the task force is, is uh, it was a sort of a working group. And if we're looking to get um, county involvement or to understand how this is rolled out in the community, um, it's interesting to me what, what roles you guys play in that and through a subcommittee, can we do that? Can there be, because um, of, of all of our uh, items, it's this one where we, if we want to leverage the funds, we need access to, um, you know, understanding what the county is doing, and that might be elected to elected. Um, so council member Fleming, I don't know, or uh, Sawyer having worked on this one with, with, us, with us in the past, do you see, is there a role for the subcommittee to play actively in this item in particular? Or, and if so, how do you see that? assuming that that's allowed through a subcommittee? Well, I think it's a good question because, you know, education, understanding the value, understanding the necessity, um, understanding the needs of not only the, the children. I mean, there are, there are this, this affects in a positive way uh, so at, at, at so many levels. And the one thing that I needed was education. And at the same time that we were hearing it, discussed nationally, we're hearing it discussed locally, and I'm wondering uh, if, if we have gaps that need to be filled 
in the in education and that and where where are the supervisors when it comes to this topic and i think um ascertaining their positions uh could help us as more, more regionally as we as because it is a regional issue and i think that we need to look anything that we do just like we look through a um a, a climate change lens I think that as we as we make decisions and in, in this um, uh, in this subcommittee that we look through that very important lens of childcare and and make making sure that we're not reversing course and losing the ground that we have gained um, in this in this uh, topic. So um, it probably once once we determine some. Um, good questions and to, to, to ask our uh, our county um, uh, comrades that we do make some kind of contact with them and find out if there are areas that we can that we can support them or they can support us uh, in uh, during uh, while we work through the challenges to childcare in this county and uh, specifically in Santa Rosa. So I, I'm, I think it's a it's something we need to be aware of. But for me, it was the, there was a fairly steep learning curve in understanding the importance because I, I don't have children. And uh, so I don't understand that I don't understand some of those challenges, but I certainly understand them now, thanks to Councilwoman Fleming. Um, that's it's really been uh, a, a, a interesting journey for me, and um, I'm hoping that that and I think that the council, the full council, seems to um, understand the value and the necessity of being very mindful of childcare uh, in our city. And I think that looking at, at, at how the county is viewing it, it will, be, will be very, very important for us as we move forward. I agree with you, John, um, Council Member Sawyer. I think that we, um, that we, we can all you know, dig in. And you know, I think if we reach out to our supervisors um, and you know, the ones who aren't our supervisors too, but um, if we talk to them um, as a group, um, not only will we be able to get their positions, but but if they hear from a few of us, they'll also, um, it will be more on their minds as they go into their year and, and set their priorities. Um, the other thing that I'm wondering is, you know, if there's a way for us to share our enthusiasm and our experience with other groups um, as those opportunities come available. Um, if there's um, rotary clubs or, you know, other um, chambers of commerce around the area or anything like that, um, Raisa, I don't know if you could keep an eye on stuff like that so that we could um, speak with them and, and share our passion for this. Because I think there's kind of nothing like having, you know, I mean, here I am with two guys without kids who, you know, are fully on board, right? So, um, you know, and, you know, both business owners from different communities within Santa Rosa. So I think that we have a powerful message to share um, if we can get in front of some folks. And I think, okay, so that helps. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Alvarez, were you gonna speak? Uh, well, I was just gonna really just support the, the comments that have been made by, by fellow council members. And, and, and you said it very uh, clearly, as business people, as two uh, men without children, we definitely understand the importance that childcare represents to our economy as a whole. Uh, for myself, for my employees that do have children, especially uh, pre-COVID and now post, hopefully post-COVID, uh, the importance of childcare is absolutely vital to not only the family structure, but our local economy as well. So you definitely have my support and, and I do appreciate the proactiveness that my fellow council members took to address the issue of, of childcare. And now during the pandemic and now as we hopefully see the light even more so. So I definitely appreciate their efforts that have been put forth. You know, and, and there was, I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but there's, there's something that we need to make sure that we don't lose track of. COVID has helped us put a very bright light on childcare because for a, on a number of, for a, for a number of reasons. And once that bright light um, on COVID starts to dim somewhat, we need to make sure that we keep that, keep that bright light shining still on a child care. And there are, there are bright lights shining on other issues as well that will, be, that will continue post COVID. But this is one of those that could easily lose some of its attention uh, once um, parents go back to work uh, for, for a variety of reasons. So we will, 
I think it's, it will be really important that, that we keep this in front of our councils and keep it in front of, the, of, our, of our, our county partners because we could easily start to lose ground as the, as the, the necessity might possibly start to wane a little bit, um, at least the perception that it's no longer as necessary as it was before. So we're, we have some work to do in making sure that it stays in front of the, um, on, stays on, on, on the A list um, for uh, issues to be aware of. And you know, um, to your point, John, I, uh, sorry, council members. Sorry. You know what, I, I'm fine with John. I mean, <laughs> I, what, I, what I'm not sure about is protocol of whether we have to call each other by our titles. I don't think but you have to. I think for the purpose of the subcommittee, <laughs> if you, you can use my first name, I'm comfortable with it. Hey, how about you, Eddie? I, I'm gonna go. <laughs> okay, let's, okay. Uh, we'll just keep it that way. More, more of a ramp, you know, that uh, the dialogue that we had before. But so, to your point, John, I think that um, it's about perception from the economists that I've heard. There's going to be long-term economic and workforce scarring, um, especially for women and people of color. And so, um, and what we know is that the key to our long-term economic growth involves really investing in those groups. And so if, um, if we hold a, a special spotlight on it, it's like, you know, before the Cubs fire, there was a housing problem. Well, before COVID, there was a childcare problem. And mm -hmm. I think we've done a, a pretty good job as a council of keeping in mind that the housing problem, you know, persists, even though we've rebuilt most of our stock, we're, we're doing everything we can. And so I think that if we can hold childcare like that, you know, and I have this vision of, this is going to sound crazy, but of one day having, um, you know, childcare um, like in the form of summer camps throughout the city of Santa Rosa, um, and that they're all based on ability to pay, and that you know we might not be able to, in one fell swoop, solve the housing crisis, but what an attractive place to live and work would Santa Rosa be if between the school systems and the um, city park and rec department that you had a place, safe place to put your child year round and that, that we would really become even more of an economic powerhouse. So I know I get really excited and um, I, I would apologize for it, but I, I think that it's really important, so. No, no it's, it's a beautiful vision. It's a beautiful vision. Universal childcare, um, why, why not, right? And, and what it means to our labor force, I mean, especially for myself in, in district one, well, we do have a large population of, of, of laborers. I mean, this this would definitely answer the question that's been um, at the forefront pre-COVID. So it, it definitely answers a lot of the needs that my community uh, in District One has. So no, definitely, uh, it's a beautiful vision, and I would love to uh, to work alongside of each each of you to, to attain that, uh, especially with contribution from businesses and and really understand that we're actually as business owners we're profiting from our our, our labor force not having to deal with this extra cost or extra extra issues every morning uh, when it comes to to our, our child care. Well, we used to, and can, summer camps, you know, I, I remember going to summer camp here in Santa Rosa. And I think that there's, I'm not sure if the, there's that much focus currently on summer camps. I'm not sure about the age requirements. I mean, what the, what the challenges might be, but uh, I remember having a great time. And even though we were probably a little bit older and I'm not sure what age group we can, we can, you know, create a summer. I'm sure that something could be created that will attract um, uh, kids of a younger age. Uh, so I think that the, I love the idea. And I, th I think it's something that we could continue to, to look at as, a, as one of the options because it's, you know, it's that time of the year and uh, those summer camps, regardless of the age of the child can be something that, that can be life-changing. If nothing else, a great memory maker. So I, I, I think we should, you know, I think we should pursue it. Okay, so um, uh, City Attorney uh, Burke had mentioned that um, obviously if, if all three of you are going out and um, doing work that it would be covered under the Brown Act, but um, if, uh, individually or, or two of you are doing something and we bring it back to the committee, then that that works. And um, so listening to this conversation, which is inspiring, um, you know, I think the, the main things are as we develop this program, so staff will come back um, to vet these program development uh, uh, elements here to the subcommittee, but the big questions are leveraging the funds, uh, leveraging the political support. Um, and I think that's where I, I he, am hearing you guys are willing to play in that space. 
uh, and um, doing so in conjunction with the supervisors. Another thing that's interesting, um, Councilmember Fleming um, being on the red, um, as we, because one of the second phase pieces of this program is again, that new facility development and rehab rehabilitation. We're not only just um, losing the providers, but we're losing the spaces that are uh, uh, eligible for people to be in given the state requirements. Um, and so that's that other piece of it. So, so we'll bring that back to you guys. Um, and I captured the vision of universal childcare and let's work towards that. <laughs> And our, um, our recreation department summer camps are included in opportunities uh, that we're pursuing. Um, so the next one is, um, you know, it's more straightforward. Um, it's the pursuit of revenue opportunities. Uh, the one thing that we're pursuing at this point through the, uh, which we'll go through council, is the formation of an enhanced infrastructure finance district. So um, I'm not sure if that's gonna go through this committee. I have a feeling it's more, uh, would go through the uh, long-term finance subcommittee, uh, but I just want you to be aware that um, there are elements or, uh, uh, sort of sub projects from an EIFD that we'll be tracking uh, because that infrastructure finance district um, affects the development of the areas in which we form that financial district. And that's a tax increment financing uh, uh, effort. Um, but the other thing um, that we brought either through the downtown subcommittee or through this subcommittee is the, develop is the creation of community benefit districts. These are assessment districts. Um, so I've talked with Councilmember Alvarez about this, the potential of something like this in Roseland. Currently we have one, as you know, in a railroad square area and downtown area. Um, but uh, my coworker, uh, Rafael Rivero is looking and working with businesses in the Roseland area to see if we could do that as well, a benefit district there. And this just enables people through a financing mechanism that the city has to participate in, but it enables um, uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, usually commercial districts, uh, to have funding to reinvest into their specific districts. Um, stop me if you guys have any questions. Um, the other thing is with our real estate manager, Jill Scott, um, and with um, our uh, parking district manager, Kim Nadeau, um, we've identified city properties in the downtown that aren't part of the uh, public-private partnership for a civic center um, that we're gonna pursue uh, development on. So specifically, we've identified lots 10 and 11, which are the small parking lots on 5th Street, and, uh, and one of the, potentially one of the garages in the downtown uh, to release them to do an RFQ for affordable housing. We have to follow the state uh, surplus land act. And so it's gonna be a phased thing and we'll be bringing that and discussing it through the economic development uh, subcommittee for what that development looks like. Um, that uh, merges with the infill development projects, including the, uh, the exclusive negotiation agreement and the uh, disposition and development agreements. So right now we only have one uh, ENA with uh, cornerstone properties on lot two, which is that the lot behind the Press Democrat building. Um, we're really fast tracking to get that done in the next six months. Um, so that's something that's also gonna be coming back here. Um, Roseland initiatives, um, we met with Council Member Alvarez. Um, you know, we have a downtown subcommittee, we have an economic development subcommittee. With Roseland being our other sort of main uh, downtown type of area where we have development capacity, you know, I have an interest in, in having sort of a standing item on Roseland issues here, um, if it makes sense. Um, because I think we need to begin really putting um, a concerted effort uh, in focus on uh, development and, uh, and uh, needs in the Roseland area, similar to how we do with the downtown. And so I just wanted to see how you felt about that being vetted through this subcommittee. Well, I'll jump in the, here. I mean, we've got, we have a subcommittee or we have a, um, a uh, what we have highlighted Railroad Square. We have naturally highlighted the downtown. 
um, because it is the, the, the virtual and physical core of the city. But I, I think that it's, we are um, well beyond the time um, of necessity for, to have a bright light and uh, shining on Roseland. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a cultural center. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's like, it would be, I, I can't imagine the city of San Francisco not shining a bright light on Chinatown. And I can't imagine the city of Santa Rosa not shining a bright light on Roseland. Uh, it deserves it deserves that kind of attention. Now, where to focus that? How exactly? What kind of body is is best used so that they can be um, nimble and be able to to quickly identify um, the, the the priorities for that for that area? Um, I, I think it's it's a natural um, it's it's our it's our Latin quarter, and it's it's a natural to have. Uh, some some really some great attention paid to that. Not in, in addition to the annexations, you know, I, I think that it's it's a natural to to pay particular attention to that district. It'll do nothing but help um, the the residents and the business owners of that area and the entire city. What, what could I possibly add to that? And and very well stated. And it's absolutely, in my opinion, the fastest growing economic sector of Santa Rosa, and you're absolutely right, uh, John. As, Santa, as a Santa Rosan, I would love to see every sector of Santa Rosa be the strongest it could possibly be economically, culturally, so we can all be stronger together. So, so thank you for those comments. You bet. Victoria. Oh, I what, can't add to that. I, I agree with what you both said. Yeah, so it's a question. The question is going to be how to, what, what to implement, what is the, because I, it's kind yeah. of the yeah, getting the cool. getting the um, what do you call it the uh, um, the DDAs or the EN, ENAs, um, uh, not the ENAs. benefit districts. Yeah, the, the benefit districts can be laborious, and I and I'm wondering how we how do we kick it off without waiting for while while we are. Assuming there's a desire to have it, I mean, you've got to determine the, the desire. Um, but in the meantime, how do we best um, shine that light on, on on what what that community is asking for as far as priority? And then the, we would need to, you know, first of all, ascertain that. You know, what are the what are the needs, um, and then that allow them allow those most affected to prioritize them and then allow this subcommittee to help um, implement and, and have a, a, a broader conversation um, the, the, with, with three council members. It, uh, I'm sorry, it's on, uh, there's, there's no, you, it's, uh, I just am adding, because I realized John, when you called on me earlier, you were asking a question and, and I don't have the exact answer. I do think that hopefully that the, that the, the body of work for that lies in this group because, um, but I, I do think that we ought to um, be thinking about the right strategy and the right rollout and almost having like a coming out party or something, some sort of, not like a specific event, but like a, an un, you know, a promotion or an unveiling or some sort of effort um, around this. And maybe it can coincide with when things start to open up a little bit more in the fall um, about like rediscover, you know, Roseland's wonderful as it is. It's not like, you know, anybody's discovered it, but um, making sure that it gets the same love and attention in a way that fits Roseland. And we might yep. be able, so I can work with um, Raphael on developing what this call that item on our economic development subcommittee agenda looks like, um, you know, because there are certain things like um, he spent a lot of time working on mobile vending, for example, um, and, um, and micro entrepreneurship and creative reuse of space out there. Um, so there are current things like how do you keep the economy or access to the economy going um, during COVID or what was lacking in terms of policy that are specific to that area that where the infrastructure looks different. So, you know, as I'm thinking about this and hearing you, it's like, I like this idea of, um, of you know, sort of 
I don't know, announcing that, you know, we've got something going that we're putting this, this uh, presence there, um, but then it's looking at the surface needs and then digging deeper because I think over time, it's a question of infrastructure. It's a question of, um, of, uh, of how over the next number of years, we're looking at some of the land issues that are there because it's been it's not been invested in for so long. And I think that's going to be as we develop that or we talk about it, uh, we can hit the surface needs uh, and then the underlying needs. And I think it's the question of identifying the underlying needs and then how does that look within a broader city work plan? Because um, I do think you guys will probably end up having to talk about that in not maybe not this year's priority setting, but next year's priority setting, for example. And, and yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of great points being made. And and I wish I had more experience as a councilman and, and really in, in, in local government to to ascertain a, a better plan. But the truth is I would definitely be depending on my fellow council members to to educate me on the the, the, the resources that are available to to the community. And, and I believe that the, the, the coming out, the announcement that it's a new day is a phenomenal idea. And it's definitely the right time for that to happen, especially with the with elections and, and, and being really just welcomed into the city of Santa Rosa for the first time ever. So I definitely see the point that we have. Actually, it's a great opportunity for us to really hit that ground running. I just, as a businessman, I, you'd expect me to know exactly what we want and exactly what we, what we don't want. But it sounds like the word community empowerment is very, very... Uh, uh, a strong word that that really tells what what I would want to be the goals to be, and that is really to empower the community. What that means to me is really a lot of meetings that involves the community, even more so than us saying, "Hey, welcome." I definitely want to sit down with each and every one of my community members to make sure that they're included in the conversation, because that seems to be the biggest uh, deterrent from involvement in the past is not feeling welcomed or included or listened to uh, within the community. So it's definitely a lot of listening sections that I see in, in my in my future. And you know the be the beginning part of that. I mean, there was a there was a lot of community outreach during the annexation conversations, and I think there may be we could probably glean um, a fair amount, even though now the information is a couple several years old. Um, I think there are probably some continuing the um, uh, issues um, and and. And uh, needs that were that were well identified during the annexation process that that can help us at least begin those conversations. So we're not starting from square one. We've got a lot of information about what the, how the community in Roseland saw their future, and I think we need to you know to, wherever we can take advantage of the information that was provided during that very. I, I think it was a pretty robust. Um, public outreach uh, um, program. Um, so let's you know, take it off the shelf and, and, and re-look at that potentially before we, uh, and maybe with some, maybe some things will jump out at us, maybe, maybe not, but I, it would be a great place to start, I think, one way or another. Yeah, and I think the thing that's interesting is that we annexed it during the fires, like literally we were still in the EOC. <laughs> yeah. And the annexation happened. Um, and then, you know, that the rebuild, et cetera, it took a long time. I think, you know, the other thing that's interesting to me is that, so again, if we look at the downtown, including Railroad Square and the Courthouse Square areas, um, they have direct access to three council members through the downtown subcommittee. Um, this would be that access uh, to a committee uh, for, for those businesses as well, or for those residents um, as well. And I think that's sort of, uh, I think that'll be helpful. Yeah. And, you know, COVID has also changed the landscape. So there may be some things that are going to bubble up to the surface now that weren't bubbling up during the annexation. And I think we need to be mindful of that. Even if some of these things are temporary, you know, we can, we, I think we need to, to be um, remembering where we are today as opposed to where we were during the fires and uh, kind of, you know, be just, Take, take advantage of wherever we can of the information, but also understand that there will be new, new, new challenges and issues that need to be uh, uh, discussed um, before coming up with a game plan. 
Yeah, and um, I just want to add because, you know, Councilor Alvarez, I mean, we're also making it up as we go along. We just will, we will develop this together and discover the tools together. Um, Eileen, just so you know, your, um, your email is online. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll develop that uh, jointly. Um, I think uh, Raphael and I will take the first crack at sort of like, how do we define this? Or um, he's out there all the time. He has weekly meetings, multiple meetings um, each week, I think, with uh, business organizations and residents of that area. And, um, and we can figure out with the community um, and through you as well how, how, to, how to roll that out. So as I'm saying, Rivero is definitely my dad's best friend since about five years ago, if not maybe even more. So any, anything, <laughs> hey, well, where's Rafael? I don't know, Dad. <laughs> you, you and me both. I'm like, if you know Rafael, I work with him. That's how I would say. Um, but that's how, um, that's how, so on um, some of these other things, again, that mobile vending and the out there program, we identified that it, there's not equal access to some of the policies that we're implementing that might be good for so many other places. But be, again, because the infrastructure was, uh, was, is not equal out there, uh, uh, it, it's just different. We weren't able to implement some of these things. So we're gonna continue doing like the out there SR, inside out there program. So we've got, that's web-based. Um, go ahead. Would it be possible to, you know, um, when you guys started talking about Raphael, I just had a little light bulb go off um, about that beautiful event that um, that you guys put on that he really um, spearheaded in our courtyard for the um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Thinking about, you know, as we, maybe one aspect of as we shine this light and it sounds like there's some consensus around this is a good economic ish initiative, but also just sort of picking up on, you know, a lot of things got um, the bandwidth from the Tubbs fire really sort of probably pushed aside some of the welcoming that we would have done. And so that event made me think about like, well, what other ways can we um, bring, you know, do more things like that, but also perhaps I'm, when we um, can have events in person, um, what it would be like to have like some subcommittee meetings in Roseland community spaces um, and to, uh, you know, because I don't think we've ever as a city done that, you know, sometimes like boards and commissions will meet at Finley Center or whatever, but would it be possible for us to, uh, I don't know what space exactly, but to have this meeting be, why not have this meeting be held in Roseland on a quarterly basis? Or... I love that idea. I mean, or even like I had this idea of like ages ago, I mean, years and years and years ago, which was like, I mean, it, I think they have to be announced as special meetings so that we can say where they are because otherwise they're usually in the same place, but we should be out in the community um, and to have a greater access. Um, we've elevated Raphael uh, to this. I don't know, uh, Raphael, if you have anything to add um, or any thoughts on that, but otherwise we will continue to work together on that. But yes, I think we should be out in the community. Yeah, that's a great idea. I, I even hope that one day we can have a city council meeting in Roseland. Uh, and, and that definitely builds off your, your your comment, Victoria. I would love to see that happen. And it's really a testament to the people that government is is there and, and, and we're we're inviting everybody to participate. It's it's ever so important. Yeah, it's hard for me to see why it wouldn't be um, you know, advantageous, but it, then again, I you know, come up with a lot of ideas that don't in the end <laughs> seem advantageous. So we'll see. I think this would be though. Okay. I think this would be great. I mean, Raphael, do you want to give an example? Like when you pulled in the county and did, um, even in COVID, we had a outdoor safe community meeting. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, really quick. So um, I think everyone there is just hungry for a greater connection, a greater engagement. So definitely, I think uh, they will welcome the idea. I think it's long overdue. I believe we can find a particular spot where we can hold some of these meetings, some of these gatherings, et cetera. Uh, but the uh, collaboration between the county and uh, the Mitote group and the city was just tremendous. And I'm really glad that uh, it came together in, in unity uh, under the pandemic and not under the restrictions, under the uh, where we had to disinfect all the chairs and tables. But we had a, a gathering there. We provided a training to the food uh, vendor operators 
on how to uh, get their permits and such and how to go through the process so there wouldn't be any confusion. But what I really enjoyed was just the connection with the, uh, the county folks as well as the other ten entities involved and uh, we made it happen. So working together, good understanding, communication, and that expectation that we were there just to, to, to improve the process, which was really was the, the beautiful outcome of it. And just out of, out of that outcome, we've been having regular meetings with county folks where our planners are involved, where uh, Bill is involved, where other folks are involved. And uh, where there's one coming up where they want to do a follow-up on, on the Mitote outdoor dining uh, project. Uh, they want an update on the farmer's market. And we also are working with the, uh, I'm also working with uh, Andrew Triple and Monet uh, on a brochure uh, to provide that comprehensive education to the, to the vendors. And the brochure is going to be both in English and Spanish. And it's just another form of engagement that we're producing out of the effort from uh, just being out there, getting to, to know the businesses and, and the community and building that trust, uh, which is greatly needed. I think the biggest takeaway for us is, you know, again, access is critical. Um, and we talk a lot in the city or like in this, in the world right now about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but access, <laughs> you don't have any of it if you don't have access. Um, and so that is what we're trying to address um, in, in, in these ways. And it does fall on my shoulders. Uh, now as a, a newly elected and representative of the area, it, it's really shown the people of District 1 that there is a reason for them to come out and speak up, yeah. that there is someone that's listening. So it does fall on my shoulders. Yeah, yeah. And you're not alone. Um, we are there to support you on this. Okay. So and then, I do want to make sure that we do it face to face, because if, right. otherwise, I mean, we could, you know, who, we could say we're in Roseland right now and who'd know we weren't. So it's kind of, we need, we need our faces in this, in this, whatever, however it takes to get that meeting together. And Raphael, when you're out in the community, be looking around for, for great spaces, maybe the one you used before, um, and so that we can do this with, with the, the proper social distancing, but have our bodies in Roseland, not just our heads. Yes. And then ongoing, I absolutely love the idea, uh, Councilman Fleming, of, of being out there having special meetings and not just in Roseland, but in other areas as well, showing up. I think it's great. Um, so, uh, you know, the just to get off the slide, <laughs> um, we do have ongoing uh, COVID response stuff. Again, um, Rafael's leading the Latinx community recovery and communication elements of it. Um, we're continuing to address right away use options. You guys, I think <laughs> uh, the very first meeting of, um, of the year was uh, waiving uh, or uh, reducing fees uh, related to uh, having to move businesses outside. Um, and this open and out, the outdoor dining, um, I know Councilmember Fleming would like to see Fourth Street closed down every year uh, in the summer, um, but those are the kinds of ideas that are interesting um, that, that we hope to have a life outside of our COVID response. Um, next slide. Uh, next slide, Eileen. Let me see if I can then go. Oh, there we go. Oh, no, one back. There, parking lot items. Okay, so on these, um, so we receive a lot of interest or inquiries or ideas um, from all sorts of areas. And um, so what we realize in the Economic Recovery Task Force is um, the, the best way to capture this, acknowledge it is to just keep a running list. And, you know, to be honest with you, some of the things bubbled up or down uh, depending on feasibility. And so these are some of those things. So I just want to acknowledge um, you know, especially because some of these came from other council members, um, that we do hear them. And if you see anything on this, um, depending on capacity of staff, we can move things around. It's not like the, the first slide is what where, where we are <laughs> um, forever. Um, so the parking lot idea, so a lot of it is pending funding. So there was a, a request to have, for example, the working capital for small businesses. These, this is something that actually the state and the county have stepped up on. Um, there, the county in particular funded uh, a, a grant program 
specifically geared toward uh, minority owned businesses that were tended to be left out a little bit more of the uh, state and federal grants. Um, the state also recognized that the uh, access to their grants was a little bit lopsided towards the large businesses. Um, so in this one, we have not had the funds or found the funds to do a working capital for small business program within the city. Um, so it remains on the parking lot. Uh, we're not opposed to it, but we have found that other jurisdictions have, or that the county and the state have been stepping into that. Um, vacant space activation, um, we're constantly looking at this idea um, you know, it's on the parking lot because we haven't, um, other than the Merc uh, Mercado, uh, where, where in Roseland, the old uh, Dollar Tree was reused and repurposed. Um, that's kind of the ideal of what we'd like to do, but we had a willing partner with the county, who is the landlord. Um, the idea behind this is to... Um, is to activate the streetscape. Um, we know that there are a number of businesses that have been closed down, but how do we use those closed businesses um, in an interim fashion or even just, just to do the facade or storefront, um, somehow activate those? Um, it doesn't necessarily need money, so I didn't say it's pending, uh, pending funding, but it's an interesting idea that pops up um, when we get an opportunity. Uh, tenant improvement is something that does need funding. Um, we brought this up in our regional economic development meeting. I know Windsor's looking, uh, looking at it, uh, but this is uh, grants or low interest loans to help uh, either rehabilitate or to do uh, some kind of new program for businesses at either the facade or interior uh, tenant programs. We have tried to have programs like this when we had redevelopment, they're complex. Um, there was, I had an interview with somebody who was doing a master's thesis on this <laughs> issue. Um, so if it's something that comes up, it is a, a large program area and we'd have to really figure out how to do that. Um, a business incubator or fab lab, we used to have a uh, maker space, that maker space closed down there. I've been talking with a couple of businesses who have an interest in doing something um, similar, especially around manufacturing. Um, you know, I think this, if we can uh, get a little bit more uh, time uh, for the ED staff, we can, you know, pursue a partnership on something like this. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be through a school or a single business, but um, it's an idea that there is a general interest of in the business community. Um, policy and regulation development for emerging uh, industries. We've kept this one on. We saw opportunities around um, early on around uh, repatriate, uh, how do you say it, bringing um, offshore businesses back in, especially for manufacturing, what um, opportunities exist around this. I think this one we're looking more um, through the general plan process. Um, if there are uh, opportunities to look at how, um, what industries might be growing uh, and where we might be able to align it with land use or um, you know whatever opportunities within Santa Rosa or Sonoma County. Um, Partner programs, this has been brought up to us a few times. We do, uh, Rafael sits on the Workforce Investment Board. Um, we uh, take a rather passive role uh, in uh, training or retraining uh, workers, uh, re-entering the economy. Um, but, um, you know, we keep this on because if there's an opportunity for us to play a larger role were obviously always interested. Um, similarly with the COVID working conditions, you know, we haven't identified any, but uh, at this point, but um, you know, an offshoot of this, for example, was the paid sick leave. Um, so those are ideas, sort of broad ideas in that way. What needs to be addressed specific to the pandemic or even outside of the pandemic um, that the city from a policy standpoint could play a role in. Um, the Downtown Preservation and Economic Protection Plan, this came from one of our council members who proposed a $75 a month fee um, for any landlord that had a, a property owner that has a vacant storefront. Um, and the idea for that was to use those funds to help support a recruitment and retention programs of businesses. You know, to be honest with you, um, I don't know how many uh, how much money that would bring in um, or the value of that we uh, are have started working with the Chamber of Commerce more 
aggressively and the downtown action organization specifically on identifying and pursuing businesses to take over vacant storefronts. Um, uh, but running a program that has a fee associated with it um, has some complications, but, but it's on here. We could certainly look into it if it rose up. And then um, a policy to the latest one, it came up during early on in the pandemic and then was brought up at a recent council meeting, again from a, a fellow council person, um, is the question of capping the percentages charged by food delivery services. We've only heard this request from one uh, business so far, um, we, but we do know that, for example, uh, San Francisco has done it, uh, a couple other businesses have done it, and that's like Uber Eats um, or those types of things that they, ch they charge 15%. It's not particularly advantageous to, the, um, to our local businesses, but we haven't heard it in the economic development division as a growing concern, but we're not opposed to looking at that policy. So those are the things that are left over from the task force um, that are that remain on our list. Are there any questions on that? I do. I do have a question. Um, it's a concern, actually. Um, the economic preservation, economic protection plan, the seventy-five dollars. You mentioned, you know, you're not really sure how much it would generate. What I do know, it was a generate a fair amount of anger, and I think there's a there's it's almost. It feels almost insulting to me to have, and I understand, I know, I know where, where the, I don't even remember which council member brought it up. I understand what they're thinking about is that if it's gonna be, if it's gonna be an empty space, it needs to be maintained properly. How can we make sure that it's not unattractive? You know, malls use their own ways of, they actually hide the fact that there's an, an, an empty space, but that's in a mall environment. And I'm just wondering who's doing this and how well is it working for them? And is there some, is there another conversation we can have about um, kind of beautif beautification of empty storefronts without smacking somebody 75 bucks because, they're, because they can't find a tenant? And so there's, I'm, it just kind of, it's, it's rubbing me the wrong way. And I, I'd, like, I'd, I'd like to address the issue of empty storefronts without giving them this what is almost like an irritant as opposed to an, an effective way of dealing with the issue. So I'm wondering if we could delve into this one, either um, put it on a, on a, um, uh, what a, on the, on the chalkboard later, you know, put it, what do you call it? It's not a chalkboard, your parking lot, yeah. you know, put, put it on, put it on the parking lot, but having it sit there, it just every time I read it, it it just makes me uncomfortable, well, and I and maybe because I'm an ex retailer, I just it no, runs me the wrong way. Yeah, I mean, okay. what we can do is we can actually take this off, um, and we replace it with, um, you know, there's maybe an opportunity to work with public art um, and see if we can put at least if if we work with the with the property owners at least put art in the windows um you know again something similar to what malls do they they board it up in a nice way or they use the storefront um and the other thing we can do is talk with the downtown action organization uh, or have them sort of uh, expand on what what that joint program with them is so it's identifying it's working with because a lot of times staff we don't know the neighbor or the the business there knows that they're going out or that there'll be a vacancy in their building um mm -hmm. so we can we can expand that but we can actually take this off what do you think committee members well what i um first of all i you know i um i i think that you're where you're coming from is the right place that um that you know we should use more carrot than stick in this environment uh, or in this situation I think that there's that every landlord is a different individual or a different corporation. And so you have some who are flat out not great actors, people who live outside of the area and don't particularly care that a large piece of real estate in the downtown is vacant and they're just waiting for conditions to change uh, to sell it or you know the city's been working with their heirs or whatever like you know like the plan is that person's going to you know pass on and then then their children will be compelled to sell it to somebody who will be compelled to rent it. I mean, and so that's one extreme. And then the other is, you know, somebody who's like has, you know, real challenges in keeping a tenant for logistical reasons or whatever it is, you know. Um, and so, you know, thinking of them all as like responding well to one intervention is probably unrealistic. Um, 
where, you know, some of them, um, you know, like if we just flat out can't get some cranky old man, you know, in Marin to rent or sell his building, um, could we at the very least entice him to let, um, you know, like, let's say it's on 4th Street, let the neighboring business use this space in front as a parklet or some, you know, or, or sidewalk dining or an expansion thereof. Um, and then, you know, for the ones who are, you know, more earnest and trying, but have genuine challenges, you know, getting in there, um, like Raisa said, that they're already trying to do with the Chamber of Commerce and helping to identify potential tenants and the kinds of businesses. And that sounds like that's already happening. And then, you know, the third piece would be like the art for the temporary situations. But I do believe that there are these, you know, more difficult and intractable uh, only profit motivated. I mean, most all landlords are going to be profit motivated, which is not a bad thing, but some who are profit motivated to the point of not being concerned about our community. Um, and those people I, I'd like to see us have um, some, you know, some sort of way to deal with. And I don't know what the answer is short of, of a fee or a fine, but I don't think that somebody who's waiting to see their investment go from three to four or five to $7 million is gonna respond much to $75 a month, except to, you know, start an independent expenditure campaign to take us down or something. <laughs> and, and that's a great point. I mean, it is $75, but I agree with John. It's, it's, it's a little thorn in the side. Had this not been a pandemic uh, environment, I, I, would, I would laugh and agree with this, but even on this economic recovery work plan, uh, on the parking lot, we see working capital for small businesses. We see vacant spaces activation, tenant improvement pilot programs, and we see one uh, detriment to a landlord. So it's really the economy that we're in. And I would, I would actually see the $75 as something laughable, but it would be more of the thorn in the side, an environment that I have no control over. And, and for that reason, I would definitely uh, advocate for, for removing that $75 a month. And then in, in the future, bring it back if, if needed. But in this current environment, I, I can't see that as being a tool that, that will promote uh, economic recovery. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And, I, and, and it's not, not to lose sight of our need to um, mitigate empty storefronts. I think there's, there, we've got to, I think we still need to come up with something. They've tried it over the years. I think they've tried every, every idea known to man um, or woman uh, to um, figure out a way to make empty storefronts that have been empty for, literally um, 15 years. Um, I, I, my business was right next to, to one of them uh, or very close to one of them. And they've just got the, the, um, the tenant improvements were so expensive that they just, they couldn't rent it. Um, but that didn't mean that they couldn't use it. They finally did, it is being used, it's finally being occupied um, uh, after all these years, but I, I don't want it. I don't want the concept to fall off the the edge. I just want this strategy to be something else that that might work a little better. And yeah. I agree with that. For me, it's it's really the timing of the of the environment that we're in right now. But if, yeah. if we're hearing that something's being vacant for five years because a tenant is waiting for that grandparent to die for the for the inheritance, it's only being uh, a negative impact on the surrounding businesses that are having that vacant lot accrue webs in the window storefront. And, and that's not proper for, for any outlook for, for a business community. Yeah, good point. Okay, so then we'll, um, I think what I'm hearing is I can just um, link it more effectively with vacant space activation and, um, and sort of take away that $75 a month. I mean, we can uh, put it in the back of our minds, but yeah. Um, but really put it towards the uh, vacant space activation concept. Uh, Raisa, I don't know if there's a limit that we could, I mean, again, I'm thinking uh, once COVID is gone, I mean, even if it's, even if it's a 5% of whatever the, the, the fair market value or, or, or of, of the lease, even that is a penalty. And then we start seeing, seeing landlords that will look at the 5% and maybe give it as a 5% discount to a potential tenant. Uh, there's nothing worse in a shopping center than an empty space. But right now in the COVID era, I, I would disagree with it. But no COVID, I definitely would want to pressure landlords to fill up spaces. And that's for the good of the entire uh, uh, strip mall. And I'm thinking of a, of a mall in this or a strip mall in this case. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Um, and I know there, there are um, programs that we can look at um, when that time comes uh, to see. Okay. Um, so that was it for that item. We went through all of the efforts and thank you very much for the, I got some good notes out of that. And I think- uh, the, uh, the and I, I should probably call for public comment. Do we have, Eileen, do we have any, any um, anyone from the community that would like to speak on item 3.1? We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you very much. So let's go ahead and go to 3.2, Raisa. Okay, um, this one, um, Eileen, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, thank you. So this one is our um, uh, business tax, how we're doing on our, what did I say? Oh, it's our 2020 quarter three sales tax. Uh, just super high level, as you can expect, our sales tax um, is really down. Um, we are uh, not doing Santa Rosa in terms of um, our sales taxes uh, lower isn't bouncing back as uh, well as Sonoma County is, uh, uh, or statewide um, is. Um, and again, just as a reminder, we lag when we on our reports for sales taxes six months behind. Um, so this is Q3, we'll understand where we are Q4, um, you know, there was a rally, of course, around uh, Christmas and Q4, or the holiday season, um, but it, it's, it's been tenuous. Um, I will say the thing that is um, saving us is a bit of an overstatement, but um, the online sales and our portion that we get back from online sales um, has been somewhat stable, um, and it's uh, thankfully a few years ago there was a, the Wayfair Act where, um, where we used to not get local sales tax it didn't come back to us if people were, were purchasing online. Um, and it does come back to us now. Um, year over year, I think it is a 12% decline um, from where we are. Um, obviously general retail, transportation and food products um, were hit hard. Um, I will say we've always done really well in auto sales, new and used auto sales. Um, we've been higher or on the higher end throughout the state. Um, that has finally been, and we were uh, anticipating uh, that to reduce a little bit. Again, our new and used sales, uh, car, car sales um, has reduced a little bit um, as well. And so there, even those aren't doing very well in this economy. Um, Let's see, construction is the one area that we see as um, somewhat stable. If you've been um, listening to any of the uh, regional economic reports or even statewide reports from some of the economists coming out, um, the uh, housing market has remained stable. And for us, construction remains uh, stable up here. Um, but that is the high, just very high level. Um, we're down, we're not bouncing up quite as well, but our, um, but our online sales tax uh, is, has been helpful. I have a question, um, is, is that okay? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious to know, um, Marisa, what you think, um, you know, I'm looking at this chart and what's actually most striking to me is what was going on in 2019. Um, you see the um, Q, what I imagine is like the Christmas bump um, from Q1, um, which is the high point on the chart. And then it just starts plummeting essentially um, into the pandemic, but a year ahead of time. Am I, is, do we have an understanding of what's going on there? Um, I have to look back because I did do a report out and I just, you know, to be honest with you, I, um, I didn't look back uh, at this point, um, I can't remember, but I can tell you next time because I did look into it. I just can't remember. Okay. The issue. Yeah, I just think it's really interesting because what you see is like in Q3 of 2020, you know, you're almost back to where you were at Q1, um, you know, pre pandemic. So, it, yeah. Yeah, know. let me go back because um, I did have I do have notes on that, and I just because what I ended up doing too on this um, was looking at um, area by area, um, and I think we had delved into you know downtown kind of like where were our hotspots um, and how were they performing uh, year over year in those quarters. 
Um, so let me go back. And yeah, look. and I know that, you know, Santa Rosa, um, you know, that sales tax is just one portion of our revenue. And I know this is more of a long-term finance wheelhouse, but it would be interesting at some point to see one of those slides. I've seen them before, like the pie chart of like where our different revenues come in and, you know, what portion of that is sales tax. I'm sure John knows all, all this stuff inside and out, but, um, but it'd be interesting to see that so we could understand like why, you know, our, our, our Santa Rosa line might lag behind the state and, and the um, county, but that we're doing other things or, um, you know, where we want to go in terms of our economic development efforts um, in balancing um, our, our portfolio of incomes. Um, I think, can you go to the next slide, please? Did you have that next? <laughs> um, no, I don't. Um, I'm but, like, can you know, produce a report and then it just magically appears? <laughs> no, I um, just threw up just the most uh, basic things. Um, and, you know, um, our deputy director of finance, Alan Alton, is on. If he wants to raise his hand, we can elevate him. But I don't. I, I think we'd have to um, go back and take a look at that. And maybe um, have him. Uh, I can have him sort of help us give give a better overview looking back. Because I remember in 2019, he and I we did have a discussion about this. Um, and like I said, I did look into it. Um, you know, what's interesting too is that we weren't alone. Everyone, they all pretty much followed the same, within reason, followed the same curve. So what was happening to us was happening countywide and in the state. So and I'm, I'll be, I'm glad you asked the question, Victoria, because I'm, uh, when, once I became aware of it and really looked at it, that is, it, it's, an, it's an oddity that I would like it. I'd love to hear the explanation to that. And then we'll all go, oh yeah, of course. But it'll, it'd be good, it'll be great to hear it. If, if I may, you know, it really sounds like this This was a time period that, that really the houses started selling again in Coffin Park and, and the rebuilt fires, uh, the inventory started coming back on. So it wouldn't surprise me that all some furniture was one of the best sellers as people were trying to replenish the couches that they had lost during the, the fire, so to speak. Uh, but when it comes to the car sales, I mean, in District 1, that's one of our highest producers as well as well the marketplace. And I can't really say that uh, at the end of 2019, if he had told me at the end of 2020, I would have said it. everybody was was back out in the open after being quarantined, and they were more than happy to go shopping and, and spend their money. But that's not the case here, is it? You know, I might even be able to do. We used to have a map um, on GIS that had um, sales tax hotspots, and you could see where things were. Let me talk with our GIS folks and see if I can uh, get that as well. Are there any other sort of economic indicator things that you'd be interested in seeing? Um, as we look into this? Um, you know, the next time it'd be interesting to see, you know, when you answer that question, if you could back it up a couple more years, um, just on the chart, because um, maybe it just looks like that, like all the time, you know? Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, um, it certainly is compressed. <laughs> uh, so uh, I will do that. All right. Well, that's all that I had. I'm sorry I don't have you know too much information on it. Um, I didn't dig too deep. I just want to let you know. Look, we have um, some of the initial Q3 um, uh, information, and I can go. I can go deeper. That's it. I think that's our last um, item. Uh, Comes no, One last thing I wanted to say on that last one. Um, um, the slide that's up right now is that um, you know we uh, are not. Um, we're not trailing nearly as badly as the, the region or the state. Right. Um, in our total, um, you know, sectors. So that, that gives me some hope. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, it's good to remember too, that, um, that Sonoma County, we're pretty diversified up here. Um, I think more so than people think because they hear mostly about tourism and yes, tourism is a huge, um, uh, factor in our economy, but we're more diversified, I think, than, um, than that statement would lead you to believe. If, if I may, in the, in the historical reports that, that uh, Council, I'm sorry, that Victoria is asking for, it's if, if we could incorporate, and I don't know how you go about doing this, but really how the fire has affected those numbers, both in, 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 in construction, uh, sales, tax revenue from from our local hardware stores and, and that type of thing. If there's any yeah. way to incorporate how the fires affect. 
Um, yeah, I can. I mean, I will tell you that um, when we looked into this um, during the fires, again, I'm sort of going way back in my mind. And by way back, I just mean pre-pandemic. Um, <laughs> when I had better memory, memory of it, um, we actually were really stable after, from an economic perspective, after the fires. I mean, construction, obviously construction was up and that was a leading indicator. People were replenishing, like you pointed out. Um, so we actually, from a sales tax, as I recall, did pretty well after that. And that's one of the things that could be that, um, you know, when we were doing the rebuild that you hit a, a, a peak and then it began going down. I just can't remember what the notes were from that time. You know, Alan has his hand up. So maybe. Oh, um, I mean, can you, um, can you promote Alan? Hey, Alan. Hello. So um, I'm trying to remember what was the question about um, uh, the percentage of of sales tax to the whole was was that? No, the question was um, on the sales tax um, revenue reports mm -hmm. that. Uh, you see a steep decline starting at the beginning of, uh, from the peak of the beginning of 2019, right. uh, you know, a year, we would have, you know, imagined that it would have started at the beginning of the pandemic, but it, it start the slide really started before that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to, so I did hear that one and, and I don't have a good answer for that. We'll, 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 we will need to do some research. Uh, I did notice, or we noticed that um, that in the quarter right before the pandemic, we were starting to see a slight decline. Um, that could have been from auto sales. We've been waiting for the auto sales bubble to burst, so to speak, in our uh, in our area for some time, and it just never happens. We're we're very fortunate that we have. Uh, a, a strong um, uh, base in that regard. Plus we have CarMax, so we kind of, if new car sales go down, we're kind of hedged with, old, uh, with um, uh, used car sales there. Uh, um, but we can go into a further... Um, yeah, I'd appreciate that, Alan. And the reason why um, is not just out of like pure curiosity, although I, I will admit to just being generally curious, it's because, um, you know, these trends um, on the graph mirror state and and low and county trends that's not right. just you know, about us here regionally and also because they predate COVID if there's some and you know, I've heard from multiple economists that our economy is generally fundamentally strong even though this is disproportionately impacted, um, you know, certain groups, you know, more vulnerable groups more than others, but that our economic, the foundation of our economy is in a good space. And so I'm wondering, you know, if there's any vulnerabilities or, or weak points that we need to address um, through this and or um, our colleagues over in long-term finance so that, you know, we don't end up with a blind spot Right. Yeah. And, and we, we will uh, be going over um, a lot of, a lot of this uh, in the finance subcommittee uh, in the, uh, um, I think in March, we're scheduled to do a revision or to present a revision of the, the long range financial forecast and then bring that to the full council in April. Okay. Um, so that'll be our, our real next chance to look at trends. Uh, we should by that time have, uh, um, we'll, we'll, we should be able to at that time go mm -hmm. back and research exactly what the trends were heading before the pandemic and now. Well, I think that um, to the degree that it's, it's possible to have um, an abbreviated version of those presentations in this group, this group doesn't need the and poor John has it <laughs> over there too, but yeah. um, it doesn't need like the full thing, but we need just enough to um, inform the decisions on economic development policy. No, I totally understand that. Just wasn't really prepared to do that for oh, this meeting. That's fine. Right. This is absolutely this good. Is kind of a wish list thing going forward because I feel like today's kind of been this synergistic meeting of figuring out 
where we're going to go and how we're going to get there. So yeah. no expectation that it would have been done today. Yeah, and for what it's worth, uh, a lot of what, um, you know, to kind of echo to what Rice has said earlier is that we, we are fortunate in that online sales uh, have uh, um, kept us afloat, if you will. Uh, you know, sales tax is about, you know, 30, a little more than 30% of our revenue budget in the general fund and property tax is around 20%. So you're looking at about half of our revenue uh, comes from property tax and sales tax in the general fund. Uh, our property tax is strong. Our property values remain strong. So that's a, a firm revenue source for us. And where the volatility is, is in sales tax, and which is why we try to diversify our uh, revenue portfolio as much as possible. Um, and all, all I can say is that if that Wayfair decision wasn't in place and we, uh, we weren't able to uh, reap uh, uh, sales tax revenues from online sales, we would be in a horrible situation right now. Um, but, uh, uh, they're still low. Um, they're still below our estimates. But uh, as as they said at the state, uh, the last meeting I, I attended, um, they are they're bad, but they're not as horrible as they thought it was going to be. So it's some hope. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Alan. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I'll, I think I'll ask the, ask the public if they would like to weigh in or have any questions on 3.2, the 2020 quarter three sales tax uh, report overview. Do we have anyone, Eileen? We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you very much. We'll just move on to our the, to the next agenda, which is talking about the next agenda. Yeah, um, so I think um, I... If, if I'll work with Alan, if we can have some kind of version of that, we'll look back at the history. We'll definitely have that on the next agenda. Okay. Okay. And the other one was Rosalind. We'll try to flesh out what that looks like on the agenda moving forward. Um, and if you don't, you know, I, I think we, well, we really should not anticipate not meeting. What, what would be our next meeting date, Raisa? The second Tuesday, um, which is um, March, uh, March 9th. Okay. Right. So uh, what I'm wondering is if we well, review where you, where you, where the, what information you've been able to gather. I don't want to spin people's wheels, but I also want them to know that we're dedicated to having regular meetings. Um, but if, if, if there is truly a gap in the information that, that we've asked for, that you just haven't been able to get it to put it together or something happens in the interim, I don't, I don't want to uh, spin the council's wheels or staff's wheels coming up with a meeting just to say we had one. I so, it's, it's, so just keep us posted. If you know, we'll we'll know what to anticipate. Is we're we're scheduled to have one in the beginning of March, and if we um, if if we need to delay for some reason and and have a more um, what a, a more effective meeting uh, in in April, then so be it. Okay. If the if the committee's okay with that. Yeah, um, I'm okay with that, except for the. Um, the thing that we um, around uh, emergency paid sick leave um, and tracking the the, um, the the hopefully coming soon the uh, COVID relief package and how what provisions if any might be in that um, for those tax credits that we said we would track. So and that um, would be a reason to definitely to um, to come together. So um, okay. I'll make sure to have that because I can give and I can give you an update in the meantime if I hear anything um, otherwise, but for sure we would want to um, vet um, any extension at that March meeting. Right. Um, well, especially if the, um, I mean, because we had the, uh, the EPSL go with the tax credit. So if they're extended, then, then I don't know that we'll need to take action, but we might need to review. But if they are not extended, that would be an inflection or a decision point for us. Right, okay. Um, all right, I think um, then there's at least three things on the agenda. 
um, with another that I'm sort of thinking about um, the the vacant space and and um, and that question. Um, okay, uh, anything else? I don't think so. Any any other staff reports, Risa, that need to be addressed? No, this was incredibly helpful, and I'm um, very, very grateful that you guys are willing to have a merger of a Brown Act meeting with the Economic Task Force, <laughs> um, and to be able to have this kind of conversation um, has been super helpful. Thank you. Well, very it's helpful. nice to know that we can have the, the same kind of efficacy inside this meeting and still have the, 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 the lack of formality that some subcommittees um, find, find it necessary to have. So um, I prefer to have to, to be on first name basis and where, where appropriate. I know staff has a harder time calling us on by our first names and I, and I understand that. Um, but uh, I'm being able to have this, these, these nimble kind of meetings I think is really effective and it's, it's been effective for us in the past and I expect it will continue as, as, we, move, as we move along as a subcommittee as opposed to a task force. And if it's okay with you, I think in the next ones, we can also um, elevate any other staff members. So again, that dialogue can be more, um, uh, more easily had. Um, so for example, I know um, City Attorney Burke is on, Claire Hartman, Scott Moon, um, just in case there are some um, input that they may want, we can, we can elevate them if that's of interest. I agree, that, that was one of the things about the, um about the task force that kind of, you know, the, th the thing that um, that really strikes me and, you know, I'm glad that the feeling came back this time is how much, um, and this is gonna sound ludicrous, but how much fun we had. Yeah. It uh, doesn't sound crazy, it was. <laughs> it was fun, but we had a really good time doing it. And I think that, yep. it, that it improved the outcomes. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that having um, staff where they feel comfortable participating, I know it's harder when you're live streaming to YouTube and know that people can watch it and so forth. But I, I really think that, you know, to the degree that we can just let ourselves go with um, that workshop mentality while being open to the public, I, I think that it's um, more effective. Yeah, I, I, it I definitely agree. helps staff actually create the programs. I mean, we would never have been where we are with paid sick leave or the childcare program had we not had that workshop mentality. Yeah, okay. I agree. And I appreciate everyone embracing that. Yay. Yay. <laughs> okay, so okay. I, I, at this point then we'll adjourn the meeting and we'll, we'll, we'll I, the council members will see you in a few hours. <laughs> see you shortly. All right. Thank you all. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.